Hi, everybody. Today I'm going to talk about a tool that we've built, Ski. And Ski is meant to help developers to find kernel concurrency bugs. So this was work done jointly with Rodrigo Rodriguez and Bjorn Brandenburg. And we did it at uh, University of the Novo University of Lisbon and at MBI SWS. So concurrency bugs are well known for being hard for developers. And the reason for this is that concurrency bugs depend on the interleaving of instructions. And in practice, it has been shown that there are many concurrency bugs that are only triggered on a very small subset of interleavings. Well, the kernel is no exception to this, and there are plenty of kernel concurrency bugs. If we go to the bug logs, we'll find examples like this one. So users found the problem in the kernel, the developers tried to analyze it, and they eventually concluded that this was caused by a concurrency bug. And they themselves said that it was not easy to reproduce. But eventually, they managed to build a test case that was able to reproduce the concurrency bug, but it could take up to 10 minutes to do it. And they also mentioned that by enabling certain debugging options, it would change the timing in such a way that it would make the test case less effective and unable to reproduce the concurrency bug. In another case, the situation is even worse. In this case, developers also managed to build a test case, but the test case would take up to three weeks to reproduce the concurrency bug. Yet in another example, users noticed that in a deployment scenario, three out of five machines could lock up, so it's a very serious bug. But unfortunately, despite this, developers had a very hard time reproducing their bug, uh, this bug within their uh, testing scenario. So what do developers do in practice to diagnose and reproduce concurrency bugs? Well, they typically rely on what's called stress testing. In stress testing, developers build test cases that provide a certain input to the to kernel they want to test. And then they repeat this input multiple times, hoping that on each one of these iterations, a different interleaving is chosen, and that eventually the interleaving that triggers the concurrency bug is executed, and therefore the bug is exposed. But unfortunately, it has its limitations. So there is no real control over the interleavings that are explored with this approach. So researchers have noticed that this is a problem, and so they came up with a more systematic approach. In a systematic approach, uh, developers are expected to use a testing tool that takes full control over the interleavings of the application they want to test. And that way, it explores the interleaving space according to its own policies, picking interleavings first that are more likely to be interesting to explore. And this approach has been shown to be effective in the case of user mode applications, but unfortunately, existing work has been focusing only on user mode applications. So this talk is going to be about the systematic approach, but instead of focusing on user mode applications, we're going to focus on kernel code. So we'd like to be able to build a tool that allows developers of all these operating systems to find whether there are or, no, or not concurrency bugs in them. So in the next part of the talk, I'm going to explain to you what's special about kernels and why do we need a different design than the one that is used for user mode applications. Then I'm going to explain to you what is our approach and the challenges involved there, and also how we implemented it, and then I'll finish with the evaluation. So existing tools to test user mode applications, they essentially interact at a very high level of abstraction, where they're aware of the concept of threads and the concept of synchronization objects. So they typically interpose themselves between the application and the kernel using mechanisms such as the LD preloads or the ptrace. And this way, they're able to create additional scheduling constraints so that they're able to pick one of, those, one of all those possible schedules that the scheduler could potentially choose. This is very nice for testing user mode applications because it does not require changing neither the application nor the kernel. But unfortunately, in the case of the kernel, we do not have such a nice interface that could allow us to exercise this level of control over the interleavings of kernel threads. So an alternative would be to modify the kernel itself and to insert our tool somewhere around the scheduler so, it could create, uh, so that it could have this type of control. But kernel modifications would have some disadvantages, including the following. On one hand, it's generally not a good idea to change the tested software because you could be creating yourself new bugs or hiding bugs that are already there. But it also has been shown that the kernel has a particularly rich set of uh, synchronization primitives 
And so this change would actually probably not be very easy. In addition, there's a third reason, which is that such a tool would a priori have a very limited portability. So if we'd like to test different kernels, we'd have probably to have to port the testing tool so it could be applicable to those kernels. So in this work, we explore a different design. We're trying to explore a design where we don't have to modify the kernel that we want to test. So to this end, we go one step below the kernel, and we go to the hardware level of abstraction. So we build a tool that uses a modified virtual machine monitor to this end. But unfortunately, at this level, we only have assembly instructions like move, add, jump. We can see the register values, the memory values, but we don't really know anything about threads or synchronization objects. So this is where we plan to put our tool, somewhere in between the kernel and the hardware, but in such a way that we don't really have to change the kernel that we're testing. So in this work, we present a tool called Ski that helps developers to find kernel concurrency bugs. And there are two goals for Ski. The first one is that Ski should be systematic in the sense that it should be able to explore the interleaving space by according to its own policies. But we also want Ski to be able to be practical in the sense that we'd like it not to have to require modifications to the kernel and also to be fast enough that this level of control will still be uh, useful and effective. So now that I've explained to you uh, the challenges with the kernel code, I'm going to explain to you what is the approach that we follow in this work. So like I've told you, we've implemented Ski using a modified virtual machine monitor. And at this level, the only thing we see is a stream of assembly instructions being executed. So there are three questions that we should be able to answer. The first one is how do we control the schedules? So how do we force a certain schedule of threads to be executed? The second one is how do we know which threads are ready to be executed? How do we know whether a thread is waiting on an object that is being held by a different thread, for example? And then the third question is, given this huge interleaving space, how do we decide which interleavings to choose first? Okay, so I'm going to go through each one of these questions in order. So like I've told you before, at the virtual machine monitor level, the only thing we see is a stream of assembly instructions. And at this level, it's even hard to figure out which instructions are associated with which threads. So to address this, uh, we made the observation that most modern operating systems, they have a, function a functionality called thread affinity that allows the user mode application to pin threads to certain CPUs. And using this functionality, we're able to pin each one of the testing threads to a different CPU, to a different virtual CPU. So this is good because it allows us to create a mapping between threads and virtual CPUs, so a higher level abstraction to one that we control, a lower level abstraction, the CPU. But we still need a method to actually exercise control and force schedules. And for this, we control the rate of execution of each one of the CPUs. So by switching on and off those CPUs in a virtual machine monitor, we're able to create different schedules. For example, we could create this one or we could create this one. So essentially, to address this question, we leverage the existing thread affinity uh, that most modern operating systems have, and we also exercise control over the CPUs. So but now we still have a question, an open question, which is, how do we know whether a CPU is actually doing, making progress or whether it's waiting, for example, on a spin lock and not really doing progress? So for this, we made observation that some, ex some instructions, when executed, they are actually a very good hint that the CPU is not making progress. For example, in the case of the x86, uh, the halt instruction tells us that the CPU is waiting for an interrupt, while the pause is a very good hint that the CPU is probably in a spin lock. In addition, the memory access patterns can also be a very good hint. So if we see a CPU that is continuously accessing the same memory location and getting the same values, it's also a very good hint that it's not actually making progress and it's perhaps waiting on a spin lock. So we address this question of how to figure out whether contexts are schedulable or not by relying on virtual machine monitor introspection techniques. So going to the third question, how do we pick schedules out of this huge interleaving space? We leverage existing work that has been done for testing user mode applications. 
In particular, we leverage the PCT algorithm. And the PCT algorithm essentially runs one thread at a time and always picks to run a thread that is the highest priority thread but is also live. And then it has its own concept of priority. And using these priorities, it is able um, to create schedule diversity. Essentially, it reassigns priority during run times, during run time according to its own policies. So this is good, but we need to extend uh, this algorithm so that it's applicable to kernels. So we generalized the algorithm so that it could support interrupts, which are critical for kernels. And we did so by uh, modifying the virtual machine monitor in a way that allows us to detect the arrival and the end of interrupts. And we also modified the virtual machine monitor so that we could control the dispatch of interrupts. In addition, in the paper, we discussed several techniques that we use to reduce the interleaving space. But note that we don't intend to be exhaustive at exploring interleaving space. We just intend to be systematic. In other words, we intend to have a policy that allows us to pick interleavings that are more likely to be interesting. So we address this challenge of picking the schedule to explore first by generalizing existing user mode uh, systematic testing algorithms. So now to explain to you uh, what is our approach and what challenges involved, I'm going to tell you how exactly we implemented SKI. So we implemented SKI by modifying KIMU, which, which is a virtual machine monitor, and it's worth pointing out again that we did not have to modify the kernel that we're testing, nor even the host kernel. In addition, we built a user mode library that runs inside the virtual machine, and that is used by kernel developers to create test cases so that they can flag the beginning and the end of the tests. And using this approach, we've managed to build several test suits, including a file system test suit that I'm going to talk about later. In addition, to ensure that despite all this level of control that we have over the schedule interleavings, we also get very good performance, we implemented several optimizations that I discuss, we discuss in the paper in detail. So SKI is useful because it allows kernel developers to explore the interleaving space in a systematic way. But at the end of this process, we end up with lots of executions. And so we still need a method to tell users that certain executions perhaps exposed concurrency bugs. And so for this, we tried, we had experiences with very different types of bug detectors. For example, the simpler ones, we implemented crash and assertion violation detectors. And we also had experience implementing more complex data, uh, detectors, such as data race detectors and even semantic bug detectors, for example, to detect this corruption. So our experience shows that SKI is flexible in the sense that it is compatible with a wide range of uh, bug detectors. And that way, it's also uh, potentially able to detect different types of concurrency bugs. So in addition, SKI also has a very powerful feature, which is that it can uh, produce very detailed execution traces and even memory traces, which can be very useful for developers in those very hard, complex concurrency bugs. Okay, so now that I've explained to you how we've implemented SKI, I'm going to tell you how we evaluated it. And for this, it's worth pointing out that there are at least two use cases. So on one hand, you could use SKI to build reg regression test suits. So you could try to see if a certain version of the kernel uh, contains bugs that have been fixed already in previous versions of the same kernel. And in the second use case, you could potentially use SKI to find bugs in, uh, in, for example, in components of the kernel that have been recently developed. So we'd like to be able to increase your confidence that the kernel components are actually working correctly. So I'm going to go in order through this, each one of these use cases. So in the case of the regression testing, um, we needed to figure out whether SKI could reproduce uh, concurrency bugs that had already been found. So we went through the bugzillas and the mailing list to find previously reported concurrency bugs in the kernels. And we looked for bug reports that were particularly well documented and also had diverse, a diverse set of properties. And we picked uh, bug reports that were uh, so well documented to the point where they had stress tests attached to them. And based on this stress test, we built uh, ski test suits for each one of these bugs. So these were the bugs that we used for our evaluation. And it's worth pointing out that the bugs that we chose have a very diverse set of properties. They affect different components. They have different effects. And more importantly, 
we were able to show that Ski is applicable to very different kernel versions, but also to different kernels. And it's worth noting again that we did not have to change the kernels at all, nor even Ski, which is a very good indication that Ski is indeed portable. So Ski was able to reproduce all these concurrency bugs, and in general it did so after executing very few schedules. And so given its high throughput, Ski is able to expose these concurrency bugs in a matter of seconds. So out of curiosity, we also tried to see how well did the stress tests that were in those bug reports did. So we ran the original stress tests, and according to our results, we actually were not even able to reproduce uh, half of the concurrency bugs, so the stress tests were ineffective. And even though we gave them up to 24 hours to run, and those that actually reproduced the concurrency bugs still took many iterations and uh, quite a bit of time to reproduce them. And this experience essentially matches a bit of what we saw in the beginning of this talk uh, with those examples. And it also shows that Ski can indeed be very useful for developers to reproduce concurrency bugs. So I'm now going for the second use case, where we try to find new undiscovered concurrency bugs in recent versions of Linux. And for that, we built a test suite that tested file systems. And we did this by adapting an existing test suite called FSS Tress. And we tested several file systems within Linux and used different bug detectors. And we focused our attention on the more recent and stable versions of Linux. So these were the bugs that Ski was able to find. So Ski found actually quite a lot of concurrency bugs. And most of these concurrency bugs were found in official Linux releases, except for one. There was one concurrency bug that was found in a patched version of Linux that a developer asked us to, teach, to test. And essentially what happened was that uh, we had found some bugs with Ski that nobody had found before. And we reported them to the developers, and developers tried to create a patch, and they asked us to test the patch. And apparently Ski found that the patch was uh, not good enough because the kernel could crash in a different place of the, that function. In addition, uh, many of these concurrency bugs are important because they affect important file systems. So ext4 is a default file system in many distributions, and BTIFS is expected to become the default file system in uh, a few distributions soon. There are also very serious concurrency bugs because since they crash the kernel, they typically can lead to data loss, and even the data race that we found in ext4 could also corrupt data. So all this is very encouraging results, but Ski in its current form also has a few limitations, and so it's worth going through them. So because we rely on pinning threads uh, that we're testing to different CPUs, there are components of the kernel that we may not be able to test very well. For example, the logic associated with the scheduler, and in particular, the logic associated with migrating threads from different CPUs. So we think that this is perhaps not a very serious limitation because it will probably represent a very small subset of concurrency bugs. And then we also have some limitations that arise from the fact that Ski is built on a virtual machine monitor. So because of this, uh, Ski is not able to find um, concurrency bugs in all device drivers. It can only find concurrency bugs on device drivers for which it has the corresponding virtual device. So we implemented Ski in KMU, and KMU actually has a very large support for devices, but there are just so many devices out there that we don't have support for all of them, of course. So it would be interesting to explore a different approach where we could use Ski's design, but instead of relying on virtual machine monitors, to use binary instrumentation techniques that are applicable to kernel code. In addition, another class of concurrency bugs that is particularly tricky and that we do not, are not able to expose right now are those that depend on the weak memory models. So Ski currently implements a strong memory model and so is not able to expose these concurrency bugs. But we hope to work on the future in a way of generalizing Ski so that it implements a weaker memory model and therefore it potentially exposes these concurrency bugs. So in conclusion, I've proposed to you a tool called Ski that is systematic in the sense that it picks the train interleavings that it chooses on each execution, 
And it's also a practical tool because it does not require modifications to the kernel. And we've ensured, given all the optimization that we've implemented, that it's fast. In addition, we've shown that SKI is effective since it is able to find and reproduce real-world concurrency bugs. I'd be happy to take questions now. Hi, this is Stefan Bucher from MPFL. This is very interesting and useful work. I have a question. Uh, can SKI detect the uh, deadlocks? Because in order to expose the deadlock, you need to be aware of the of, of 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 the first of the two sequence of locks. And if you were to use the, the heuristics that you describe on the slide, it wasn't clear to me how would you detect that you know a lock operation happens and just before another lock would happen, you would switch the thread. Um, so we didn't try using the, trying to detect deadlocks, uh, but for example, in some operating systems, you actually have already uh, mechanisms to find deadlocks, such as lock depth, for example. And so it would be interesting to also explore the possibility of using deadlock detectors that check whether, for example, an execution hang, and then you could see whether it was caused, for example, uh, by a deadlock or just a hang that is not caused by deadlock. I see. And, and my second question is, if you could quantify a bit uh, the effort of actually instrumenting a kernel and uh, ex exposing these, these locking primitives to the, to, the dead, to, the, to the test runner instead of just using the, uh, the, the modified QME that you mentioned. So what would be the cost of actually modifying the kernel rather than taking your approach? Yeah, so that's a hard question to answer without actually doing it. Um, but for example, I can point to you that Data Collider also proposed a data race detector, which is a different class of tools. But I also made the point that it would be quite complicated from their point of view to implement such a data race detector for kernels. And so they chose a different design that did not require such significant changes. So this is the only thing I can tell you right now because we didn't actually do that. We chose a different design. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Srivatsa Bhatt from MIT. Uh, I have a few questions regarding the number of threads you use for uh, testing your um, uh, for getting concurrency bugs. So I assume that you have a thread running on each CPU. So the number of CPUs you use for your simulation will uh, automatically restrict the kind of races that you're looking at, right? Like for example, if you're using four races, that means four, four CPUs, that means you're effectively looking at four different executions and interleaving them. So how would you catch uh, concurrency bugs which are interleaving of much more than the number of CPUs you have in your simulation? So we implemented SKI on KMU, and KMU actually has a support for a very large number of virtual CPUs. So that in, that in practice is not the problem, especially given that it has been shown that many concurrency bugs, the vast majority of them, can be triggered with just a few testing threads. So we don't need a large a number of uh, threads to reproduce most concurrency bugs. Okay, and, and what do you do with uh, concurrency bugs that affect a single CPU? For example, if you have an interrupt handler that runs on a given CPU and then you have a per CPU thread on that CPU in a real scenario which also accesses, say, the per CPU data structure of that CPU and they are not having the right locks to like, synchronize between them, how you cannot actually like, separate them into multiple, uh, you cannot pin the interrupt handler and things like that. So how do you handle such scenarios? So I'm not sure I understood the question. Are you talking about so uh, let's concurrency say an bugs handler. caused by interrupts? Sorry? Are you talking about concurrency bugs caused by the interrupts? Uh, by interrupt so I, I would suggest Sorry. that we take this offline since we have okay. to start the next talk. Sure. But it okay. sounds like a good in-depth question. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Let's you. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you.